Okay, welcome, Larry. Very good, Sue. Thank you. Let me just find my slide. All right, very good. All right, can everyone see this title slide? <clears throat> All right, very good. Well, good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm glad you could make it. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful day out there. And But I can't um, think of a better way to spend part of it than by having a very robust discussion of the prevention of infectious diseases, okay? Certainly works for me. Um, I've been with Extension now. I just had my 10th year service anniversary. So I've, I've, um, it's been an interesting uh, 10 years as well. Um, most of my professional background is in uh, agriculture. Uh, in fact, I spent 24 years in the cranberry industry with ocean spray. So when my career path took a hard left turn from agriculture into public health, uh, I didn't realize what I was walking into. Um, my eyes get open in a big, big way. I did not realize the extent of this problem in our communities. Um, I, I had heard of Lyme disease, but that was about the extent of it. And so when I started my uh, vertical learning curve and started talking to people about their experiences and things they were doing to help pr protect themselves, and, and I, I started making a, an observation over and over and over. And I wanted to share, this is basically my first learning when I entered this realm. Everyone hates ticks, okay? And this is not a casual hatred. This, this is guttural hatred, all right? And so when you say the word tick to a person, it might remind them of when they were a kid and had their first encounter with a tick and having to have their mom or dad remove it. But this, this hatred actually goes well into adulthood. Uh, so people just don't want to deal with these things. They, they get freaked out by them. And, and for good reason, because these things can transmit a variety. Not, it's not just about Lyme. There's a variety of different uh, diseases that these ticks can cause. Uh, looking at this from a high level, uh, Lyme is not a new disease, all right? That Lyme is not something that popped up in Lyme, Connecticut 50 years ago and started spreading out. Uh, Lyme is a re-emerging disease. Uh, the genetics show that this bacteria has been on the planet for perhaps 100,000 years. Uh, so it's it's been around, but we've, we've actually have done some things to bring us back. And we'll go through the reasons for that in a little bit. But Lyme, as I think everybody knows, is, is quite endemic throughout North America, um, but down even into areas, some areas of Latin America, uh, it's a big and, and increasing problem in Europe and countries along the Mediterranean basin. And Lyme even occurs down in Southeastern, uh, uh, down in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so this is something that's uh, endemic in, in about 30 countries around the world. So everybody's dealing with this. Uh, if you look at the United States, yeah, all six New England states have the highest incidence rate of Lyme disease in the country. So if any of you felt like you were living at ground zero, it's because we are, we are really in the thick of it. All right, let's look at the different players that uh, uh, we have. Um, for us baby boomers, tick identification for us when we were kids was pretty easy. This was the only tick we had, the good old American dog tick. Um, 
I consider this to be more annoying than a real public health threat, even though it can vector the bugs that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. Um, but in Massachusetts, up, up north, those two diseases are quite rare. The Lone Star Tick. This is the new tick in town. And it's not named Lone Star because it comes from Texas. It's, it's because that adult female has that bright white spot on her back. And this, this creature has been spreading north steadily for decades. And a number of ecologists think this is another sign of climate change. You know, that fake news stuff um, that, that the earth is getting warmer and we are seeing plants and animals in places where we never used to see them before. And up until about 10 years ago, the northernmost established points in for Massachusetts were on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Well, a year after I was hired, I was called out to Sandy Neck Beach Park in West Barnstool. And the park staff, uh, they were seeing a tick they didn't recognize. They knew what dog ticks and they knew what deer ticks were, but they, they were looking at something different. And that's a six mile long peninsula. And I went out and did surveillance there and I found Lone Star Tick from one end of that place to the other. They own that piece of real estate. They're not on the beach, but they're in the uplands uh, above the beaches. Then several years later, I was called out to Shining Sea Bike Trail in East Falmouth. And we found another very well-established population. So what, what we're pretty sure has happened is that um, Lone Star was introduced to Sandy Neck um, by migratory birds. Pretty easy, to, that's a perfect flyway. Pretty easy to think about birds stopping off on one of the islands, picking up some Lone Star ticks, landing in Sandy Neck, they fall off, lay some eggs, boom, off we go. Well, that bike trail is not exactly a flyway for migrating birds. So once you get established in Sandy Neck, I was pretty confident there are animals on the ground that are moving this creature around. Ticks are great hitchhikers. So along that bike trail, I put up um, uh, trail cameras. And uh, I very quickly um, saw different things that were interesting. So this grassy strip next to the bike trail is where we found active Lone Star ticks. And I'd see this big gap, you know, flock of turkeys, they'd be moving north one morning and a few days later they'd be coming south and when they were first describing the lone star tick they almost named it the turkey tick because that is a preferred host um yeah lots of bunnies in that area and i happened to run into a hunter that hunts in that area and he told me that every time he takes a rabbit the ears are just loaded with lone star ticks I was curious about wild canids. Yeah, a lot of coyotes in the area, they get pretty large uh, territorial ranges. So uh, very good at moving these ticks around. And a very dapper Bigfoot out for a morning stroll. Uh, this is one of the reasons I became a scientist. You go out looking for data, you don't know what the heck you're gonna find. All right, some differences between the ticks like dog ticks and deer ticks that we're accustomed to. Uh, these things are aggressive, meaning they have great vision and they can run and they can run with the speed of a spider. If they see you from say 20 feet away, they're gonna come rolling at you like a little race car. And I've seen this in action. And the adult females like other ticks, uh, she lays her eggs in a mass. And that egg mass might be four or 5,000 eggs. And they hatch out in early August and they hatch into these tiny larvae that they're less than a millimeter wide, all right? So you end up with these very high concentrations of Lone Star Tick larvae. So if you're walking along and you bump into one, generally you meet most of the family in a hurry. With that aggressive behavior, you can get Sue, you're grimacing. <laughs> you look like you're watching a Stephen King movie. So within, within minutes, you can get two or 300 of these larval tick bites. Now, the larvae don't transmit any disease, 
Um, but those those bites will burn and itch for four to six weeks, even uh, with a treatment like cortisone. And they don't transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease. They have their own unique set of pathogens. Uh, ehrlichiosis and tularemia can be quite serious. We have not found those pot, uh, pathogens in the Lone Star ticks here yet. We have found starry. That's a type of rash disease with flu-like symptoms. Uh, so we have tested ticks positive for that. And I know that Cape Cod Hospital has diagnosed and treated people for starry. But the real game changer with this tick is the bite of a Lone Star tick can give you an allergy to red meat consumption. And this can be as mild as hives, but all the way to anaphylactic shock. <clears throat> And it's not just beef, but it's pork, lamb, and even beef-derived byproducts like beef-derived gelatin. And if you think about processed foods, um, beef-derived gelatin is used in a lot of different things, including those marshmallows that we roast with our kids on 4th of July. And I've just recently learned that the other foods that will trigger that reaction are even high-fat dairy products like ice cream. Who can think of a life on Cape Cod without ice cream? That would be totally, totally unfair. All right, but this is still the, the front and center and tick of importance with us. Uh, we all call it the deer tick, but the, the proper name for this tick is, is the black-legged tick. Now, deer ticks are very different than Lone Star ticks. They don't chase after you, all right? Uh, deer ticks are blind, <clears throat> so they, they're an ambush predator. They have to wait for dinner to come to them. So they have this behavior called questing, all right? And so you see this adult female deer tick, and she's got her front legs up in the air like she's signaling a New England Patriots touchdown, all right? Very wishful thinking here. Um, well, she's not. Uh, she's evaluating her environment chemically. Um, her nose is on her front legs and she has an acute sense of smell. And one of the things she can smell is carbon dioxide. So if you're walking through an area, maybe with your pooch and you're, you're all breathing regularly, you're changing the concentration of carbon dioxide around you and she can detect that. Um, she can also detect changes in temperature like body heat. So the closer you get to her, she knows something's in the vicinity and she can detect vibrations. So while she can't see you, she's got a lot of data coming in toward her and she's gonna to orient towards that and wave her legs and wait because at the end of those legs, she has this beautiful little claw and all you have to do is touch it. It's going to attach and start climbing and looking for a place to have some dinner. <clears throat> all right, let's look at the hardware. Here's a tick head under the microscope. <clears throat> those things on either side of the tick's head, those are called palps. That's what the tick uses to taste you and see if you taste interesting enough to become dinner. If you are chosen, it takes these things here. These are called chelicerae. They're like little scalpel blades with hooks. And what that tick does, it makes an incision, hooks in and pulls. And it does this over and over. It's kind of like doing the breaststroke and swimming. And so with each tug, it's driving that beak of the mouth part down deeper and deeper into your skin. And that's what we see here. Uh, pretty impressive hardware. Uh, it's fairly long with respect to the length of the body. Um, and it's got those nice recurved barbs like little fish hooks. <clears throat> so if you were ever trying to remove a tick and felt like you were ripping out some of your flesh? Well, it's because you are. And, and a tick doesn't start sucking blood immediately. The first thing a tick does, it injects you with tick spit, all right? They've got no social graces whatsoever. And tick spit is absolutely fascinating, at least to a science geek like me, because it's got so many um, interesting chemicals in it. <clears throat> and one of the things in tick spit is glue. So they get the barbs, but they actually cement themselves in place. 
and tick spit contains anticoagulants. That'll keep your blood from clotting. Uh, vasodilators, that'll increase the flow of blood to the point of attachment. And things to anesthetize you. That tick does not want to be, want you to even remotely feel like you're being bitten because these guys are gonna be there for a while. From start to finish, a tick might be um, feeding to repletion or engorgement uh, four or five days, all right? So that tick goes through cycles of sucking blood and spitting, sucking blood and spitting. And when it's done, it'll secrete an enzyme, dissolve that glue and back itself out and may have left you with a few microbial presents. All right, why the name deer tick is a misnomer. This tick has been documented to be associated with 125 different vertebrate hosts. So it's not just about the deer, it's not just about the mice. There, it, this is a complex ecosystem. There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, the rodents are key though. Uh, they're what we call competent hosts. And what we mean by host competency is that these creatures like mice and chipmunks and rats um, have the ability to harbor this Lyme disease bacteria and transmit it into the tick population. So it's, they're kind of playing like microbial ping pong. Birds play a role a couple ways. We saw that birds are, are good at dispersing ticks from it, around the area, but there are some birds that are competent hosts for that Lyme disease bacteria, uh, one of which being um, our good old friend, the wild turkey, but some of our songbirds like our American robin. And then we got a whole bunch of creatures that are incompetent hosts. So things like deer and raccoons, they cannot infect a tick, all right? But they can supply a blood meal and that'll help, help keep the tick population rolling along. All right, the risk of um, getting a disease in a tick bite is year round. And we'll look at some data associated with that. But the greatest risk isn't where you might think it is based on the data. It's not from these adult stage ticks that just started coming out you know, a, a week or so ago, and they'll be with us into September. And in our surveillance research, we find that 50% of these things are packing the bug that causes Lyme disease. The greatest risk actually is from these nymph stage ticks, and they just started coming out about a week ago, and they'll be with us into August. And, and much lower rate of infection, one in five. But that's a much smaller stage of the tick. So as we were trying to think about how do we convey this to people so they can develop a search image, how big is a big tick, how, how small is a small tick. And uh, I discovered bagel toppings are a perfect way to illustrate this. An adult stage deer tick is the size of a sesame seed. And even with my failing vision at age 65, I can certainly see a, pop, uh, a sesame seed. Those nymph stage ticks, however, they're the size of a poppy seed. So something that small with eight legs, a really bad attitude that can plant you on your butt for a very long time, if not permanently. So if we look at the data, yeah, we see cases of Lyme disease every single month of the year, January, February, March, and out to November and December. Um, so tick season starts January 1st, goes to December 31st, and starts up again January 1st. So anytime you get temperatures above freezing and a break in snow cover, you have tick activity. So if you look at the summer months right now, when that nymph stage tick is out, that stage of the tick is responsible for 85% of all tick-borne diseases. So we have to be vigilant year round, but at this time of the year, we really have to be on our game. And not everybody's impacted equally. This is Lyme disease by age group. And if you look at the far left, um, kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme disease in the state. So what this shows is, is that whatever parents have been doing to protect their kids, 
is, is not working. Okay, we got to rethink the game plan to protect our kids better. And some of the things I recommend the parents, they might not necessarily want to hear or agree with, but they will, they will do a better job. And then we see the incidence rate is lower for people in their 20s and 30s. People are starting careers, they're starting families, you know, the pe people are busy and not as much outdoor activity time. But as we get older, there's a couple things going on. Uh, we have more leisure time. So, so um, ticks and, and golf and gardening go hand in hand. And, and as we age, our immune system is starting to play the back nine, so to speak. So we have this um, double peak of, of susceptibility. We have a couple other emerging diseases. Um, the top chart in blue is babesiosis, which is kind of like getting malaria. Very serious, it can, it can outright kill you. And then on the bottom chart, anaplasmosis, which can be very serious as well. And if you look at the age distribution, it's very, these diseases are very uncommon in younger people. Doesn't mean they don't occur, but, but not very often. 95% of all cases of these two diseases are for people in 60 and older, all right? And one of the things when I came to Cape Cod and worked here, I, I don't live on Cape, but um, I, I was very interested in demographics. And if you look at the median age of people in Massachusetts, it's 39 years old. Well, we have two towns on the Cape where the median age is 60 meaning 50% of the people are under the age of 60 and 50% are older than 60. And if you look at the other towns around the Cape, and if you look at Falmouth, yeah, mid fifties. Um, so we have a highly susceptible population to um, not only Lyme, but babesiosis and anaplasmosis. Born basically, uh, they are the children of the Cape but they're still significantly older than, than the median age of the rest of the Commonwealth. Um, winners. I, I usually get this call in the spring from uh, the media uh, or from people. Larry, it was brutal. We had some really, really cold days. And, and what did that do to the tick population? It's kind of like wishful thinking because everyone knows when you get our first frost, mosquito season is done. And people are hoping that that same effect goes to the tick population. Well, are Cape Cod winners all that harsh? Not in my mind, it's a matter of perspective. When I worked for Ocean Spray Cranberries, I spent 24 years traveling to Wisconsin, where I went by the name Sven. Yeah, that's, that's Larry back in the day. Wisconsin has real winters. 20 below zero for extended periods of time is not unusual. And in Wisconsin, uh, deer ticks are, are quite healthy and Wisconsin's um, quite endemic for Lyme disease. And I think this also explains why Wisconsin has the highest per capita consumption of brandy in the country, all right? Those people are absolute warriors. And, and the reason for this is, is that ticks have adapted to make a chemical called glycerol. Well, what the heck is glycerol? These guys make antifreeze, all right? Isn't that clever? And the way this works is glycerol prevents ice crystal formation in cells. So if you get an ice crystal in a cell, it's going to puncture the cell wall and whatever's in the cell is going to leak out. And that's not good for the health of the creature. But they also discovered the Lyme disease bacteria feeds on that chemical as its principal source of energy. So this is a perfectly engineered little package. So baby boomers and such um, will remark to me, uh, Larry, this was not a problem when we were kids. How, how did we get to be in this predicament? And this is me thinking about that problem. And, and one thing that people automatically go to is to blame the deer. And if you look at, you know, this deer, you know, those, those um, red blobs on the back of this deer's ear, those are fully engorged female deer ticks. 
And if you look at how many eggs they can lay, yeah, they can account for a lot of ticks. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, my colleague, Rick Ostfeld in, in New York at the Cary Institute, he, did a, he shared with me a 14 year study he did where he looked on, on that horizontal axis, he looked at the density of deer in the fall and then he looked at the density of nymph stage ticks two years later, because there's a lag in the life cycle, and that's on the vertical axis. If, if the density of deer was a good predictor of the density of ticks, those data points would line up in a straight line, right along that, ax, uh, that, that red line, but they do not, they, they clearly do not. And if you look at that statistic in the upper right, R squared, 0.007, the deer density and tick density have zero correlation, okay? And, and we have research data to show the same thing. If we look at, you know, Cape Cod, we have a, a density of deer about eight to 10 per square mile. And if you look at Nantucket, they have about 50 or more per square mile, they're everywhere. Does Nantucket have a five times higher tick density than Cape Cod? No, they're the same. They're exactly the same. So one of the things we can look at is land use management patterns. So we have been cutting down steadily a lot of trees. If you look at, you know, in the, what's happened over the last 60 years. And this is really to accommodate, you know, building, you know, all these suburban neighborhoods. And so that's kind of what Cape Cod looks like right now. So we didn't just cut down tree, the forest, we, we have fragmented the forest. And that has significant ecological implications because when you cut something down into a smaller and smaller size patch, you reduce biological diversity. And that seems to be absolutely key here. So at some point you start losing your top tier predators like fox. Fox are the most efficient predators of these reservoir hosts like mice and chipmunks and, and voles. So what we've done as a result, we've turned over the entire landscape to these reservoir hosts. So we, we can't unring a bell. We can't go back to what life used to be like. We just have to understand that we, we created this environment. We have to understand and adapt it how we're going to live in this environment in a, in a protected way. All right, so we talk about our program in a three-phase plan. Protect yourself, protect your yard, and protect your pet, all right? And uh, so the way my job description should have been written <clears throat> it was to take business away from doctors and hospitals by whatever means necessary. So in a sense, um, I'm in the family protection rack and, and I love that a lot. Um, here's an average family on Cape Cod. This is obviously Provincetown, if you've ever been out there and they need protection from tick-borne diseases uh, as well as from themselves. So the, the boilerplate recommendations, the long pants tucked into the socks, uh, as I've been working here on the Cape the last 10 years, I see people making very bold fashion statements, but you're not making this one, but it certainly is effective. It keeps the ticks on the exterior of your clothing until you can see them. Um, wear light colors, that makes sense, makes it easier to see those ticks. I tell people when you come in from an outdoor activity, just throw your clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes. That's all it takes. You up the temperature, drop the humidity. Ticks aren't that tough. And real shoes, okay? So if I'm in a place like Nickerson State Park and I see somebody coming down the trail wearing flip-flops, I absolutely cringe. And, and I may pull them aside and have um, the dad tick talk with them. In the event you do get a tick bite, um, what do you do? And, and uh, people have, people call me about removing ticks and they have their own ideas 
um, that they want me to validate. What about the dish detergent or the Vaseline or the flaming match trick? I don't know who came up with that one. But, but the proper tool remove a tick is just pointy tweezers, all right? Um, you just grab that tick by the head as close to the skin as you can get. And, and you don't have to rip it out, but gently pry straight up and, and it will pop. In the event you see something left behind, uh, that's when a number of people, uh, it's 911 call Larry. They're in an absolute panic. And I'll be talking to people that, you know, almost sobbing that the head's embedded in them. Do they have to go to the ER and get it dug out? Well, well, basically ticks can't get their heads into you. It's just that beak of a mouth part that we looked at earlier. Um, that's the only thing left behind. And when that's broken away from the head, uh, it, it doesn't have the, back, the, the bacteria are up in the tick's uh, salivary glands in the head. So that, that um, mouth part, it's, it's like a soda straw. It's not going to infect you. So you just hit that with a little neosporin and it's going to dissolve in a couple days. I tell people um, in the event of a tick bite, record the date. All right, because the symptoms of something like Lyme can show up in three days, might take a week, couple weeks, might take a month. All right. So if you record the date and now at some future point, you're not feeling like your old self and you want to, you, you're going to have a conversation with your primary, you've got a reference point to start that conversation. I tell people, save the tick. All right. Um, uh, a lot of people do not, uh, you know, flushing the tick or otherwise getting rid of it some way, somehow is what people do. But the, that tick is evidence because like we do in our research, you can send that tick to a, a lab located in, in UMass Amherst. Uh, so you would go to tickreport.com. And when they get that tick, um, you're going to get a report uh, in three business days or less of um, and, uh, and a standard DNA panel test is, is 50 bucks um, and it's good data. Unlike the human blood test for Lyme disease, uh, this test is 99.9% .9 accurate. And uh, those reports are put into a database. So if you went to tickreport.com and, and you could put in your own zip code, it'll pull up the tick reports for your neighborhood. So you can kind of see what pathogen activity is out there. So I, I wanted to go through a couple tick reports as an example uh, to illustrate some things. Here's a deer tick that came off um, a three-year-old boy in Norwell. And this tick was on the kid's head. And they send you a picture of the tick in an estimate of feeding state. Well, that tick was fully engorged, all right? That tick was on that kid's head for maybe five days. Obviously, the kid didn't have a hairdo like me. I mean, I would have found that tick pretty much immediately. So this tick tested positive, um, that top line in red, for Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the agent that causes Lyme disease. So without medical intervention, this child certainly would have come down with Lyme disease. But this tick was co-infected and co-infection is something we're really trying to reinforce or get into the heads of the medical community because in our experience 10 percent of the ticks are packing more than one pathogen and you can get more than one of these diseases at the same time so this tick was also carrying babesia that causes babesiosis now we already um, have shown you that, that babesiosis in, in kids is pretty uncommon, but it can. So, so for the patient, these are hard data, irrefutable data of what a uh, person was potentially exposed to. For, for a doctor that's, that's on their game, they can take these, this information and use it to give their patient uh, a more accurate um, clinical evaluation and figure out what to do with you. Here's a tick that's a little closer to home. Uh, this is a woman in East Ham. Her tick hit the lottery. That was positive for every single thing of interest to us. And that tick was partially fed. So we don't know the patient outcome in these cases, 
but I can't imagine what the combination of those various pathogens, how, how that clinical presentation might look. All right, I spent a lot of time talking about repellents as a first line defense against a tick bite. And repellents come in a few different flavors, all right? So this group up top, um, the DEET or DEET alternatives like Bicaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus, those are for treating exposed skin. So what that means is the tick won't bite you where that repellent is, but it just might keep walking around until it finds a place where there's no repellent. And then the real headache for me is on the bottom, the all natural products. And parents are seduced by these type of things that they're, they're using something safe and effective on their kids and nothing could be further from the truth. Here's the big difference. That group of uh, repellents up top, those are EPA registered products. So if that label states that it repels ticks for six hours, there are data on file at EPA to support that claim. These all natural products are EPA registration exempt, meaning the, the manufacturer does not have to show any proof whatsoever that, that they work at all, all right? Um, I wish, they're fraudulent products that I wish the Federal Trade Commission would swoop in and take them off the shelf like they're doing with um, fraudulent bed bug products. Um, there's another repellent that's used to treat clothing uh, that contains permethrin. And so, yes, yeah, for treating like things like pants, uh, this is a picture from my sock drawer. Uh, some days I like to come to work as superhero day. And, and for treating shoes. And, and this is pretty effective and keeps its activity through six washings. Um, what I found in my research with this product is if a tick gets exposed to a treated fabric surface for 60 seconds, it's guaranteed to die. And that it might take five minutes, might take 10 minutes, a little bit longer, but the outcome, the tick cannot escape. And I tell people treating footwear is really critical because those um, nymph stage ticks that cause 85% of all of our problems, they're down in the leaf litter. The first place they attach to are your shoes. So I tell people treat your footwear every four weeks. So put this in your, your phone calendar as a reoccurring uh, meeting, just to remind yourself that it's time to retreat my clothing. The biggest thing I had as an issue when I found out how effective this is, uh, you couldn't find product. Um, so I met or sat down and with the general managers or owners of all the major garden centers on the Cape, and I convinced them to stock this product. And, and you see a number of different brands and different formulations, but they're all identical. They all contain one half percent permethrin. So Sawyer in the upper left, that's a water-based pump spray. Uh, most of the other formulations are aerosol, but you go to a garden center and you can pretty much, you know, find, find the product. And, and I go into garden centers periodically and I just, you know, it's how our sales going. And I'm happy to report that they're out of stock more than in stock. So the word is getting out there. It's, that's wonderful. Now you can also buy pre-treated clothing. Uh, Insect Shield invented this technology. So you can buy clothing from them directly, but they also market it through other brands like Orvis or LL Bean or Ex Officio. And in the last couple of years, another company emerged, um, No Fly Zone up in Maine. Similar technology, same bottom line it's effective through 70 washings, basically the life of the garment. And the third way you can accomplish this, you can send your, your favorite gardening clothes to Insect Shield and they'll treat them and send them back to you in a couple of weeks um, with that 70 washings claim. And, and it's a nominal fee. It's, it costs about 10 bucks a garment to get them treated. So there's three different ways you can do this. All right, the elephant in the room because parents will look at me or grandparents and say, you're telling me to put my kids or grandkids in clothing treated with a synthetic 
in pesticides. And I nod my head. Yeah, I don't give ground on this. I say, remember that slide where I showed kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme in the state? In the state? Let's talk about this. This is not a toxicology barrier. This is really a psychological barrier. So I'll spend as much time as necessary going through, you know, the points, the talking points on toxicity. If you do the arithmetic, permethrin is over 2,000 times more toxic to a tick than a person. People are big, ticks are little. It does not take a whole lot to knock them off. EPA has a position, reasonable certainty that permethrin-treated clothing poses no harm to infants, children, pregnant women, and then they extended that to nursing mothers, and their criteria certainly would be conservative. And the reason for this is that uh, that class of insecticides, the pyrethroids, have very low skin absorption and whatever small amounts absorbed is metabolized in a couple hours. And they've tested this. Uh, you, you put some permethrin on somebody's skin and the, and the byproducts show up in their urine a couple hours later. Uh, National Research Council, that is not a lightweight um, group. They, they raised the question about long-term exposure because this clothing was originally developed for the military. And they said, we're going to have people in this clothing for long periods of time. What are the implications? So in this evaluation, uh, people were wearing permethrin treated everything head to toe, um, wearing the clothes 18 hours a day, every single day for 10 years. And when they rolled up that aggregate exposure, they saw no reason to expect an adverse effect. And finally, what I show is that Permethrin's the uh, agent you would you would slather on an infant for scabies mite, and it's the standard uh, product to treat head lice, which is making a comeback in our school system. So what what I kind of look at is an extremely low risk cup, and when I weigh that against the consequences of one of these tick-borne diseases, for me that is easy easy math. <clears throat> so. Habitat, where do we get these things? Well, this is a picture I, I um, took off the CDC website and it's accurate, but misleading at the same time. Sure, you stay to the center of a trail and, and no ticks. And once you get into you know, vegetation, yeah, that's where the ticks are. Uh, in, a, in a woody, tall grass field, yeah, plenty of tick habitat there. Well. Surveillance work in, in the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station showed that two thirds of the people that were submitting ticks to them for identification and testing got them from their own backyards. So yeah, ticks and gardening activities, outdoor activities, perfect. Now for deer ticks, you're not gonna find them out in the middle of the lawn, short grass, direct sunlight, high temperatures, low humidity, they cannot survive that environment. But we, we do know now that lone star ticks can venture into that environment. So as they become more numerous, I've got to rethink about our, our protection plan. But you go to the edges of the lawn that might be in partial shade and you get a transition into brush and trees and leaf litter. So much lower temperatures, much higher humidity. That's where you're gonna find the ticks. But if you think about this, um, those woody ornamental plantings next to your house or along your, your walkway, yeah, that can be tick habitat too. So as part of a one-two punch program to the treated clothing, I am an advocate of perimeter yard sprays, all right? And there's a couple ways you can do this. You can do it yourself. You can go to a garden center and get a hose-in sprayer. Uh, we have a video on our website, capecodextension.org, that demonstrates how, how to do this and, and the timing, or you can contract with a professional service. And there's a number of companies that do this, but, but buyer beware, all right? There are companies that offer and actually push an all green, you know, natural botanical oil um, based product. And the research that's been done on these um, green products 
uh, at University of Rhode Island, really good research that I've read. They show that um, you might as well be spraying water for the amount of protection they offer you. They, they just are not able to do anything, all right? You, you need something like um, bifenthrin or permethrin um, to get the job done. Now you can use these um, safely because I do get questions about, you know, pollinators and, and other creatures um, and, and environmental contamination. But, but permethrin, um, when you spray that, it, it binds to leaf litter and soil particles. It's, it's not gonna go more than like an inch into the soil profile and microbes are gonna break it down in about a month. So it's not gonna to go to long, uh, groundwater, it's not gonna wash off site in a rainstorm. That's because permethrin is just not water soluble. There's a product on the market that's very popular uh, in some areas and with some people, these tick tubes. And basically it's a cardboard tube that contains cotton balls treated with permethrin. And the idea is that mice will steal the cotton balls, take them down their burrow, line their nest, and they self-treat. And the initial university study showed that, that yeah, the mice had a lower, tick, lower larval tick load on them. But, but what, about, what about nymphs, what the, the stage we really want to be concerned about? Well, two very good studies were done on this. One in New York at Fordham University, Tom Daniels and Kirby Stafford in Connecticut. They each showed that these tick tubes had absolutely zero effect on tick populations. And they both came up with identical reasons uh, after speaking with them. They said, mice aren't compelled to steal cotton balls just because they're there, all right? And, and not all animals that carry ticks steal cotton balls. So chipmunks don't, squirrels don't, rabbits don't, birds don't, raccoons don't. So unless your yard was inhabited only by white-footed mice, that had an obsession for cotton balls, there's no reason to expect this product to work at all. Needless to say, EcoHealth has taken me off their holiday greeting card list. And, and I'm crushed, I'm still in therapy trying to, trying to deal with this. Here's some interesting news. Um, people re may remember there, there used to be a, a vaccine for people. Um, ironically, there's a vaccine for pooches, but not for people but it was removed from the market in 2002 because there was some growing evidence that it was making some people sick. Well, Val, uh, joint venture with uh, Valneva and Pfizer, they have a candidate vaccine in phase two clinical trials. They just started that. So they've got something that looks positive and they're, they're extending the evaluation. And so maybe within a year or two, uh, we'll see something on the market that's gonna gonna help out in a big way. Now we have to remind you that um, Lyme is only one of five diseases that these deer ticks can transmit. So you can vaccinate for Lyme, but you got to be mindful of the other four diseases. This has been making big news. Um, about a, another vaccine, and it's actually not a vaccine at all. It's it's um, the media is not handling this correctly, but there's there's a product that's also in phase two clinical trials, where it's monoclonal antibodies. So it's not a vaccine, and what it does it it prevents the ability of the tick to infect you, um, and when you're treated with this product. Uh, you're, you have a eight month window of protection. So between the two, the monoclonal antibodies and the vaccine, between the two, we might have something. And finally, uh, pr pet protection. Yeah, this is my OG slide. So if you have animals that roam outside, uh, certainly tick checks are, are something you wanna do. Um, cats, as it turns out, are pretty immune from Lyme disease. It's, it's even hard to do, induce in the lab. But, but pets like dogs and horses and goats are very susceptible to Lyme disease. So there's a number of over-the-counter products available. What I recommend to people is that 
before embarking on a treatment uh, regimen, uh, talk to your veterinarian because based on the age of the pet, whether it's pregnant or nursing, that all might point you in a different direction. But in talking with a lot of dog owners, uh, a lot of them have swapped out of those monthly topicals like K9 and Vanix 2 to this Ceresto collar. And it, largely people are very happy with that product and you get eight months of continuous flea and tick control. And Insect Shield, they were not gonna be denied a marketing opportunity. Um, they uh, sell permethrin treated uh, vests for dogs and, and these neck gaiters. Um, I got one of those vests from Insect Shield and uh, a colleague in my office, she walks her dog uh, in Nickerson State Park every night, always picking up ticks. I gave her this vest to try out and she told me that Maggie is now completely tick free when they go for their evening walks. So this product um, does seem to work pretty effectively. And I received a grant from Cape Cod Healthcare and I scripted and produced 10 YouTube videos of every topic about ticks. So there's one on Lone Star Tick, there's one on permethrin treated clothing and footwear, how to do a yard spray, tick identification, diseases. Um, so you get 90 minutes of material. So make some popcorn, pop a cold one or two, and you get 90 minutes of the Larry show. So what we've done is we've simplified the game plan considerably. You look at a number of other extension programs and it's a list of eight to 10 things to do. But a lot of those recommendations don't have any science behind it, no research to back it up. So our program is evidence-based science. So tick checks and use of permethrin treated clothing you do that alone, you've reduced your chances of getting a tick bite by 90%. You fold in a perimeter yard spray um, to further reduce exposure risk and pet protection. One, two, three, it's that simple. And with that, Sue, we can open the floor and take any questions that people may have. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Larry. Um, I'm gonna start with one question. Could you repeat the type of test you were talking about? And my question also is, if you're just bit by a tick, do you think that you should get tested or not necessarily, or I'm just curious. When I talk to people about whether they should get a tick tested um, and, and they're sure it's only been on them for you know, less than a day, because that's the 24 hour rule of thumb. If the tick's on you for less than 24 hours, the risk of transmission is, is low. It's not zero, but it's low. And I tell people what you can do is hold on to that tick because that tick can be tested um, 500 years from now. DNA is quite stable. So I tell people, if you're not sure you want to get the tick tested, um, hold on to it and just see how you feel. And if you at some point are not feeling good for some reason, you can get the tick tested and start you know, talking to your doctor. But if you get a tick bite, I would give you primary heads up anyway. Hey, I, I've got a tick bite and, and we want to see how this goes. Okay. And did you say there was a specific test that was better or just whatever? Or do the doctor's offices know what type of tick test to give you? Um, there's, there's a diagnostic test for people, but it's unreliable. That's one of the problems. You can get false positives, you can get false negatives. So that's why I tell people, let's prevent the tick bite in the first place, because if you get a tick bite and now you're not feeling good, if you walk into a doctor's office, the outcome is not certain. And that should be scary. It would scare the daylights out of me. Okay. And someone said, what about doctor giving a single dose of doxycycline? Uh, there are some doctors that do that and some, some don't. Um, I can't really comment on it. Um, Barnstable County doesn't want Larry Dapsis, Dapsis practicing medicine without a license. So I'm not, not a doctor, never even played one on TV. So I've got no professional uh, opinion on that practice, but I know it's, it's quite common. Okay. Um, oh, and so, someone wanted to ask about off with DEET, if that was effective, because you didn't mention it specifically. I mentioned oh, deep. 
Um, okay, so any of those products? Yeah, D, double E, T. Um, D is very effective, um, and and there are some people out there that are paranoid that it's neurotoxin or endocrine disruptor or cancerous, and and the toxicology record on D is squeaky clean. I mean, we've had that product since World War II. Um, I tell people that you you can't learn toxicology on Facebook. All right, you're not gonna get that from social media if you want the real skinny on any active ingredient at all that you're curious about you go to the national pesticide information center at oregon state university and and they they have the facts and and uh their website the fact sheets they construct are extremely well written very clear so npic and one more question. Um, what are there a lot of ticks at the beach generally? I mean, I would there, think less because there isn't a lot of vegetation there, but are there you, you, you're you're safe on the beach. The okay. the ticks are really if you go into the grassy dunes, you know, you'll find dog ticks there or the uplands above the beach, that's where you'll find all three species of tick. But they're not they're not on the beach. Does anyone else have a question? You can unmute yourself or you want to ask. I didn't see much else in the chat. Sure, maybe maybe I just scared them all. I, oh, here's someone. Okay, hi. Um, so doing the yard, oh, when we have a lot of greenery, trees and shrubs and dead leaves and things around pretty close to the house. Um, you know, should I put my effort more into clearing things at the ground foot level and trying to, you know, clear out and make an open area there um, or or concentrate more on things falling down like from the trees? Because I don't I never understood if the ticks really fall down more or come up more. They come up. Ticks do not climb trees because that's not a smart way to find a host. So so if you. If you find one on your head, it didn't drop out of a tree on you. Ticks start oh. out, the, the nymphs are in the leaf litter. Um, adult stage deer ticks might be on vegetation 18 to 24 inches off the ground, so knee high. Okay, yeah, someone just asked how high are ticks in the brush and how high should you spray? So that Yeah, I when I treat my pants with permethrin, I spray at least up to mid thigh and then I turn them inside out and I spray the pant leg on the inside uh, up to knee level. Thank you. So in my business, you gotta think like a tick. Mm -hmm. I have a um, question. I, oh, I have a question, yeah. Um, I think my question on how high you spray, I was thinking of spraying the yard perimeter. Um, you know, you, you have, ornamental bushes around your house and such maybe they get head, head high or something you know you spray the whole bush or just down underneath or just just cover everything if you're doing these kind of perimeters for, for the two summer sprays basically mid to late may and mid to late june that's directed at the nymph stage tick so i would just spray the leaf litter all right um I also recommend a spray in mid-October for when the next generation of adult deer ticks is out. And then I would spray the vegetation up to a couple feet from soil level to two feet high. So you're recommending three treatments a year, is that right? Is that what it means? Yes. Yes. So one sort of round now, it sounds like, or a little sooner than now it could have been. Yeah, but you can catch up now, put one on now, and then, you know, the end of June. And then end of June also, and then in the fall. Okay, okay. And first lower and then higher in the fall. Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, Judith, you had a question? Sorry. Yes, um, I, I went for an hour's walk this morning that included a little pass through at Peterson Farm off Woods Hole Road in Falmouth. And when I got home, I took a white, uh, white star, um, a Lone Star tick off myself. It had it had just bitten me, but you know I was able to pull it out, so it hadn't been on very long at all. Mm -hmm. Is there value in sending that off to TickReport.com to get it into the database? Um, that would be a donation of fifty dollars to their database. 
Well, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I would just be mindful that, yeah, you, you have Lone Star. I mean, it's pretty clear Lone Star is part of the Falmouth uh, ecosystem. Um, and if the tick, what, what we don't know is how long the tick has to bite you to transmit that red meat allergy. That's something that needs a lot more research. Um, so just be mindful of things like that going forward. Okay. So not seek any treatment at this point because, um, I mean, it, I've got a little red spot, but not, I know it wasn't on long and I know nothing's left behind. I would leave that call to your, your primary. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it's, it's not me, um, yeah. but just give your primary heads up. Hey, Lone Star Tick, what do you know about it? And that'd be a good way to test your primaries. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Looks like Bug raising his hand. He's, he's, he's either raising his hand or he's telling me to be quiet. I think he's raising his hand, but he's muted. I don't know if he knows that. Bud, you're muted. I can't read lips. Bud, we can't hear you, Bud. I'm looking is, at. Is he swearing at me? I might. Bud, we cannot hear you. First time zooming? I think he was not? saying, I think he's saying he doesn't want to go out walking because he's too scared he's going to pick up a tick, unless I'm projecting. I just told you ways to be invincible. <laughs> you should be you should be mindful but fearless. Someone just said she had a tear, a dear oh, tear. Can you hear me now? Oh, there, yes, yes, we can. Yeah. I was wondering where's the best place to buy the spray repellents? Let's see. Um, what's the nearest garden center you have in Falmouth? Mahoney's. Yeah, Mahoney's. Yeah, Mahoney's would have it. Mahoney's. Oh, okay. And we had someone that say, would you repeat the resource of yard spraying DIY for yourself? Let's see, in terms of doing it yourself? For, yeah, the resource for yard spraying, someone just asked. Yeah, I mean, our, our capecodextension.org uh, mm -hmm. yeah. has our demonstration video, but there are, um, companies like Fowler and Sons that, that do a lot of perimeter yard sprays. And the reason I mentioned them by name is that, that that's the company that they brought me in twice to train their employees. So that tells me that they're really thinking about what they're doing here. Well, what about what about it being toxic to pets then or animals? Toxicity to animals? Yeah. Well, um, cats are very sensitive to permethrin their little livers can't detoxify it. Mm -hmm. And so what I tell people is that, I mean, that question comes up about, you know, I treated my clothing, can my cat sit in my lap? Well, once that spray is dry on the fabric, it is perfectly safe for cats. I meant in the yard, actually, spraying people's yards. Yeah, once, once the spray is dry, things, okay. are, things are fine. Okay, just curious. Oh, good question. Yeah, I just thought of that. I don't even have any pets. And someone commented, I had a deer tick bite itch for one and a half years. Was that a comment or a question? Comment, comment. Okay. The topic. And yeah, that's a good resource. I will post when I post this video, I'll post your site too for people to come watch some of these videos. I, I had a person call me after we posted them and he told me I was a rock star, which I thanked him for. And he told me he binged watch all 10 videos wow. three times. All right. Now I was thinking this guy is really an enthusiastic student or he needs to get a life. Well, he but, must be very educated. Now. Yeah. But these videos, I mean, people from outside the county find our program and take advantage of resources 
These videos have found their way all the way down to Australia, believe it or oh not. Wow. Yeah, we've gone international. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, so someone just asked, where can I find recording? I am going to download it and record it and post it as soon as I can. And what I will do is actually, I, I will just, I can email it to the group. I usually, yeah, what I'll do is I'll just email it to the group that's not whoever registered when it's up, just so people know if they don't read our social media. That's what I'll do. But, you know, within a day or so. I'll have to take note that because I knew it was being recorded, I did yeah. watch my language. Yep, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, and that's why I warned everyone that, you know, you might show up on the video. Hopefully not, but. Yeah, it's mostly speaker view, but there probably will be some faces in there. Okay. Any other questions before we finish up? All right. We really, really appreciate your doing this. Thank you very much. He donated his time here. Oh no, well, I'm on the I'm on the county clock. I mean I'm, That's, I'm, oh okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> he was paid I'm here in, not by I'm, us. Here in, I'm here in Middleborough in my my home office, but um uh no, this is this is what we do. Um, but I'm looking forward to being able to be back um, in a room with with people again. Uh, I had that experience yesterday for the first time in a year and a half, and and I really enjoyed it. I mean, this this platform works. I mean, I've I've gotten this to, I've taken Zoom to a new level basically. Um, so yeah. we're we're getting the, we have been getting the word out. Um, but what 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 I am discovering is that uh, there's a number of people uh, on the Cape that don't have computers or feel comfortable with this type of format. So, so um, that reinforces the importance for face to face meetings and like council and aging centers and libraries and or garden clubs and such. Yeah. We, yeah, we're very conscious of that. And we are trying to get people back into the building for programs, but we don't have a date for it yet. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Larry, one more question. Um, are you available for any follow-up questions? No. Um, once once we leave this meeting, you will never see me again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, my, my contact information is on the website. So email me yeah. or, or- Or email me because- me. Uh, I sent you guys all an email, so you have my email. So email me, and I can pass it on too. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got a lot of things. You can find me, and and we're always open for business. Yeah. Okay. Thank Definitely. you. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Larry. This was great, and I will let everyone know when I have a recording to send you. Excellent. Take care. Enjoy right. the rest of this day. Thank all you, right. folks, and stay tick safe. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was welcome. Right.